or a webinar of any sort, uh, you know, I welcome questions as we go along, uh, just in case it influences the flow of the discussion and leads in a particular direction. Uh, but since we're saving questions uh, for the end today, uh, what I'll ask of you guys, uh, everybody who is attending today's webinar, is that you have uh, pencils and keyboards at the ready uh, for when the time comes to, to ask questions. Uh, so feel free to be <coughs> taking your eyes off the screen for a few seconds and jotting down questions as we go uh, so that you can be ready when the time comes. And uh, I'll make sure that there's plenty of time left for questions at the end because that's oftentimes where the, the meat of the, of the learning and knowledge comes from with these webinars. Uh, as Colette said, uh, much, of this, much of this presentation today is going to be based on a piece of work that was prepared by a de-identification working group. I'll give you some more context about uh, the uh, framework into which that group fits a little bit later. Uh, but the, uh, the, the end product of this working group was a set of best practice guidelines uh, for uh, de-identification uh, when it comes to disclosures. Um, so <clears throat> really what, what this webinar and what this paper about um, is more about integration of de-identification. So it's less so about all the de-identification techniques and that. I mean, obviously, you can't talk about the integration of de-identification unless you're talking a little bit about the techniques and giving people an in, uh, some sense of you know, what they might do in what circumstances. But it's more about integration. And a large part of that integration has to do with risk assessment uh, and, and work of that nature. Um, so um, without further ado, I'll, I'll uh, proceed uh, into today's webinar. But keep in mind, it's going to be about integration and less, uh, less so about uh, specific techniques for de-identification. De Anyone who came out of the um, eHEL uh, Sorel versus IMS webinar, which was held yesterday, I think there were a fair number of, a uh, fair bit of discussion in that one about techniques, and obviously you can feel free to reach out to Colette if you want to know uh, more about de-identification uh, techniques. He's well versed in that regard. Um, so a little bit of, uh, a little recap of the agenda of what we're going to do today. So it's key definitions and background. Uh, we're going to start with key definitions first, because uh, it's almost hard to talk about the background until we get a few baseline things uh, set with those definitions. We'll talk about a few principles that guided um, this, this whole idea of integrating de-identification into uh, health system use disclosures. And then we'll talk about the process. And the process is where you're going to see all the meat of this, this integration. And then we'll have a little bit of time for, for questions at the end. I should mention that, um, you know, it's it's often the case that uh, folks like myself who are involved in de-identification and the, the health system use uh, world, <coughs> we assume things uh, because we're so used to talking about particular scenarios. But in this case, most of what I'm going to be talking about is situations where we're looking to make disclosures without consent. And that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Uh, when you're looking to make a disclosure for whatever purpose and you have consent, uh, it's pretty easy. Uh, you don't have to worry quite so much about um, things like de-identification and minimum necessary because typically what you'll find is that the person who is consenting to have their information disclosed is consenting to a specific amount of information. So the, you know, the types of information and the, the, the nature of the variables uh, are pretty clear. So the, for, for the vast majority of what we're considering today is uh, situations without consent. Okay, so a couple key definitions here just to get us started. Um, <clears throat> the first one is de-identified. Um, the, the interesting thing about our working group um, that I was a part of is that, uh, of course, if you put uh, you know, half a dozen or a dozen subject matter experts on de-identification uh, in the same room, uh, they can't necessarily agree on the definition of what it means to be de-identified. Uh, for, for those of you who are uh, involved in the world of health system use and disclosures, uh, you know yourself that 
there's a whole lot of different manipulations that you can do with data, some of which leave it very re-identifiable, uh, yet some people will say that those manipulations have de-identified the data. Uh, we all know that that can be problematic. Uh, certainly if you attended yesterday's webinar, Sorel versus IMS, uh, you'd, um, you'd have heard lots about that as well. Um, I guess if you didn't attend it, you always have the option of catching uh, the recording that was made, uh, just as uh, this one will be recorded, so as yesterday. So <clears throat> back to this definition of de-identified, what we're saying here is that de-identified means that the data has been, been manipulated such that the risk of re-identification is acceptable. Okay, so there's a little bit of softness in there in that, well, what does it mean to be acceptable? It's acceptable to whomever. So to an organization, to a person, to a custodian of personal health information. So somebody is going to make that assessment and set some sort of threshold as to what is an acceptable level of risk. Uh, back to that uh, comment about risk, when we're talking about risk here, we're talking about risk of re-identification. Right? Because whenever you're de-identifying data, the whole purpose for your de-identification is to prevent re-identification. Uh, so so that's, the, that's the agreed upon definition that we had for this work, is that your data has been manipulated such that the re-identification risk is acceptable. And as I mentioned, of course, de-identification exists on a spectrum. You can do some basic things with names and uh, uh, health insurance numbers and you might call that de-identified, but in reality, um, your data could be very identifiable if you have uh, population outliers uh, in your data set. Okay, so the second definition that I want to uh, settle on here is health system use. And uh, I imagine uh, for those of you in the webinar, there's probably a fair number of you who uh, continue to use the term secondary use and not not suggesting that uh, there's anything wrong with that, but there is a bit of a trend uh, happening at a national level and within a few uh, provincial organizations um, to refer to the, ter the, the concept that we had or that we were discussing as secondary use, uh, referring to that as health system use. Because um, it, it really, the term health system use gets at the <coughs> idea that um, there isn't any sort of first or second primary or secondary use of information. All the uses are equally valid and important and end up in providing better care to patients. Uh, so health system use is the, is the concept we're talking about here. So when we talk about health system use, there's four main, um, four main areas. There's clinical program management. So that's your things like uh, improving, say, uh, uh, diabetes uh, treatment or maybe uh, improving wait times, that sort of thing. Um, there's health system management. Uh, the easiest way that I think about health system management is simply the, um, you know, it's the efficiency of the health system, right? So are the dollars making it to the right place? Are we uh, getting the best bang for our buck in some sense? Um, then there's public health monitoring. So that could be your things like uh, understanding uh, H1N1 transmission, uh, or maybe uh, foodborne illnesses, uh, something like that. Uh, you know, current current activities right now would be uh, some stuff happening with uh, E. coli uh, in Europe and now is coming over to North America. And then you've got research. Uh, and we all have a pretty good sense of what research is, but uh, some of you can appreciate there's sometimes a little bit of overlap, uh, for, for lack of a better term, between research and some of these other activities. Uh, it's a little bit gray. Uh, so if, if, you're, if you're wondering about what bucket a particular use fits into, um, don't think so much about the buckets. It doesn't really matter if it's clinical program management or it's research. It's all equally valid. It's all uh, use of information for the, for the betterment of care. Now there's a couple things that are missing out of this definition. Uh, missing might have been a bit of a harsh word. Uh, but um, there's a few other activities which people are kind of debating as to whether or not it really fits into that health system use uh, definition. Uh, there's quality assurance. 
<clears throat> so that could be uh, designing, uh, using data to potentially improve data or using data to improve systems, either new systems or old systems. Um, <clears throat> anyways, I, I won't get into that uh, too much, but there are a few, few things there which uh, some people may consider health system use, others may not. So, so now that we've got those two concepts of de-identification and health system use tackled, uh, I'll just give a little bit of background as to um, this work that I'm talking about, and specifically these best practice guidelines that, that form the basis uh, for the webinar. So the Council of Deputy Ministers of Health uh, have been discussing the idea and um, uh, the concept of health system use for a while, uh, obviously getting the best bang uh, for your buck and, and making the, the most use out of uh, personal health information for the betterment of the health system. Um, they uh, struck a technical advisory committee on health system use. Um, I, I will probably refer to them as the technical advisory committee for short. Um, there's quite a, quite a bit of makeup there. Uh, but within the technical advisory committee, there's a number of activities that were struck um, under those auspices. Um, some of you may be participating in the Health System Use Knowledge Exchange, uh, which is um, being run by CAIHI, uh, the Canadian Institute for Health Information. Uh, so that's one activity. Another activity is this working group. So the Data De-Identification Working Group uh, had experts from a bunch of different organizations, so Manitoba, Ontario, uh, Newfoundland, various organizations within those jurisdictions had the Institute for Clinical and Evaluative Sciences, uh, GEO, <coughs> with Khaled's participation, uh, University of Ottawa, uh, Khaled hits both those uh, areas, of course. Uh, we had some participants from Canada Health InfoA and as well some from, um, from CAIHI. Uh, the original goal of this working group, or how, how it was originally envisioned what we were going to tackle, was to develop a set of best practices for de-identification of health data. And this, this original goal sort of hit at the heart of uh, that whole challenge that we face about what does it really mean to de-identify data effectively. And um, you know, we had, some, we had some discussions in that regard. Um, and, and the more we talked about it, it really seemed like we couldn't get away from the whole uh, context of disclosures, uh, particularly, of course, we were considering health system use disclosures. It really just, it seemed like it was artificial. So in the end, as our, as our conversation evolved and we got a little bit closer to, you know, realizing what, what we could do, what we could manageably do, uh, we realized that the end product was really more about integration as I've mentioned to you, right? So it is a best practice guideline for managing the disclosure of de-identified health information. So it's about integrating de-identification into uh, the disclosure process. So a few principles uh, to guide us, uh, in, in fact, to guide the, the working group. Uh, some of these are going to seem pretty obvious. I mean, that's, that's the very nature of of principles. Sometimes once you say them, uh, you realize that you um, probably spent too much time agreeing that it was a principle because it was a, a pretty solid piece of knowledge that everybody agreed to in the first place. Um, and certainly the first one is, is evidence of that. Um, minimum necessary. And this is a, this is a principle that, that runs through um, any uh, privacy uh, thinking group, so any privacy office or any group that's uh, considering disclosures um, or even, for that matter, I suppose, collection or uses of personal health information, right? So you, you, want, to, you want to be uh, collecting, using, and disclosing the minimum necessary that allows you to achieve the purpose. So in our case, we're talking about disclosures, disclosing the minimum necessary. In disclosing the minimum necessary, we essentially want to maximize anonymity uh, while still allowing the original objectives that were identified, so the idea of identifying purpose, uh, we want those objectives to be accomplished. 
right? So in, in a health system use disclosure perspective, if a researcher says, okay, well, I want to, um, you know, study the relationship between a particular uh, type of cancer and, and diabetes, um, you know, um, they've identified a very clear need. They may have gone through research ethics board approval and all that sort of stuff. The goal of the de-identification is not to give them less data than what they need to research uh, the question that they have at hand. It's to make sure that they're getting the minimum necessary that they need, right? So trying to make the data as anonymous as possible while still letting them do their work. Another principle is that uh, anyone who's making a disclosure uh, should be knowledgeable about de-identification. So what does it mean to be knowledgeable? Um, well, they should be well-informed, so they should be reading up on the topic. They should be capable of applying, uh, so that means they should be able to, you know, use some of the some of the basic techniques. It doesn't necessarily mean they can um, apply every technique, and they might not need to consult with others on techniques, but they're capable of using some of those techniques. And that if they are participating in any sort of de-identification. They need to make sure that they're compliant with any legislation or policy. So it's a whole part of the knowledgeable uh, nature of the people who are disclosing. Now, what I would suggest, or at least what my experience is, and uh, sort of came up in discussions through the working group, um, this is the, the knowledgeableness of some of the disclosure uh, disclosures about de-identification. It uh, might be a little bit of a future state. We might not quite be there yet, where there's a little bit of an onus on all of us to get a little bit uh, more knowledgeable about de-identification. That will come with time. Um, the next principle is that whatever process we choose to follow, or whatever elements get added to that process, or however complicated it gets, it should be commensurate to the risk. So if we are engaging in some situation with you know, heap loads of personal health information uh, that are that's putting us in a, a potentially a, a more risky situation. Perhaps we're disclosing um, outside of province or outside of country uh, to parties we've never worked with before, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, if that's if that's the nature of the business that the organization is in, then they should have a process that kind of matches that. If they're in the business of you know, disclosing information uh, exclusively to government bodies within, say, a, a jurisdiction, uh, perhaps the process should match that as well. Um, <clears throat> any sort of consideration of de-identification should uh, be considering a risk assessment. And when I'm talking about risk, I'm talking about re-identification, as I mentioned before. Uh, not only should it consider that risk assessment, but it should also be iterative with the de-identification. So whenever you do some sort of risk assessment and assess whether or not the risk is above or below some threshold for, for disclosure, uh, if it doesn't meet your threshold, then you might want to launch into another bit of de-identification. So you apply some more de-identification, and then you give another assessment to risk. So you go through an iterative process to get yourself where you want to be. And not only should it be inter iterative, but your risk assessment should be consistent, repeatable, and transparent. So your risk assessment should be something shouldn't be something that you're pulling out of a hat uh, or making up every time uh, you get a different disclosure. Uh, you should have some sort of consistency and repeatability to it. Another principle is that you should be uh, mitigating using some sort of mitigating controls for any residual risk. Now, I'll talk a bit more about mitigating controls later. Uh, and you should always, always be considering your disclosures in some sort of legal context, right? So you should be taking a look at legislation, uh, any data sharing agreements, any organization uh, or you know provincial policies around disclosing personal health information. You need to really be in tune with that sort of thing um, whenever you're considering disclosing personal health information. Again, remember, we are talking about situations without consent, right? Um, <clears throat> if, you have, uh, if you have consent, uh, 
you would need to be considering these principles in a different context. Not to say the principles would be invalid, but you'd have to be considering them in a different context. Now, some of these principles came from a recent uh, white paper that was produced by uh, an InfoA group. Uh, it's the Health Information Privacy Group. Uh, it's, a, it's a group that I participate in, uh, representing Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, but they produced a, a set of common understandings uh, for privacy and EHR information flows. And the common understandings are essentially uh, those things that we hold true and the things that we need to hold true in order to be better uh, sharing information uh, bet between jurisdictions within Canada. And uh, it was interesting to see that sort of cross-pollinization um, between the work of the, the Data de Identification Working Group and the Health Information Privacy Group. Um, it was, it was particularly nice to see. And if anybody, any of you are interested in taking a look at that InfoWay uh, white paper, uh, you can find that on the Canada Health InfoWay website. It should be there under the resources page. OK. So talking about the process, because <clears throat> we want to get to the, to the heart of things here, we want to talk about how we're, we're integrating de-identification into a larger process for disclosing personal health information. The um, very first step is that you want to uh, receive a request for the information you want to be reviewing it. Um, once you've received the request and you've given some review, that's when you want to be assessing some re-identification risk. So you assess your risk. Um, perhaps your risk is acceptable and you, you know, move, move on down the line. Uh, maybe your risk is not acceptable and you want to apply some de-identification which is more than likely going to be the case. Um, you're going to have to do something with your data. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty rare that you're going to be giving out data wholesale uh, without um, you know, at least removing some fields or variables. Um, so you apply some de-identification. We'll talk a little bit more about that, some of the techniques and stuff. And as I mentioned, this is going to be an iterative process. So you apply your de-identification and you hop back up and you start to re-identify, or sorry, you start to assess your re-identification risk. So you get a little loop there between de-identification and assessment of re-identification. Once you get yourself to some acceptable threshold, uh, you would then go on to execute some mitigating controls. So that could be, you know, data sharing agreements or other conditions that you're placing on the party to whom you're going to disclose the information. And then once you're done with that, uh, you're going to disclose. You'll see a little bit later I'll talk a bit about monitoring and audit. Um, once you disclose, it's not really the end of the game. Uh, there's still a little bit of an onus to do some work after that. Now, um, <clears throat> before disclosure, um, and this is, this is the mantra that I like to uh, communicate to anybody that I'm, I'm talking about this, this process for, for evaluating disclosures. Until the data is out the door, you always have the ability to say no and stop what you're doing. And you also have the ability, although it's not really represented in this diagram, except through the fact that it's in sort of a yellow, cautious state, uh, you always have the ability to kick it back and take a step back in the process. Right? So you might uh, get your way through the process. You might be going through some uh, preparing some mitigating controls and you might realize, oh, maybe I didn't properly consider this parameter and you need to kick it right back to the very beginning and take it to the drawing board and review the request right from the beginning or potentially get some, some more information from the person who's making the request. So until the data is out the door, you have some flexibility. You can always back it up and you can always say no. All right, so the first step in there, receiving the request and reviewing it. Now, I have to admit that I, I can only really hit the, the tip of the iceberg uh, when it comes to the content that's in the, the best practice uh, guidelines paper. I, I, as, you, as I go through some of these steps in the process, if, you, if any of them uh, really hit a chord with you, uh, what I would encourage you to do is to take a look at the best practice guidelines and read it in a little bit more detail. Because uh, I'm, I'm really only able to hit a few things here. Um, you know, when you when you are tasked with writing best practice guidelines, um, 
you, you certainly want to do a complete job of it, and that's what uh, myself and the folks on the working group tried to do. We tried to put as, as much meaningful information into the guidelines as we could. So receiving the request and reviewing, um, first of all, there's definitely a need for a formalized process. We are talking about uh, disclosing somebody's personal health information, right? This is information that was more than likely uh, collected through a, a primary care instance, right? So they're presenting for care. They were probably in the most, uh, one of the most vulnerable situations in their life, right? They're either injured or they have some other sort of medical uh, situation that's happening. Um, they've given their information to the person providing that care because they're in that vulnerable state. And now what we are talking about is we are talking about disclosing that personal health information not for primary care, and we're doing it without their consent. So that definitely requires some element of formality, okay? Um, that formality could be as simple as an application, uh, or it could be as complex as uh, series of meetings and presentations, um, you know, whole protocols, that sort of thing. Uh, so really, you you know, different levels of formality will work in different organizational and, and data uh, custodianship uh, situations, uh, but it, it definitely needs some element of formality. Um, clarification is often required. So you've got requesters who are looking uh, to get information to answer, say, a research question or a, um, you know, a, a, a question about uh, public health, um, but that doesn't necessarily translate easily into database fields and ICD codes, you know. So there's there's clarifications that's often required to get at what the heart of uh, the question is, so that you can provide the right data and the disclosure. And that normally requires a relationship between the person who's going to disclose the information and the person who's requesting it. In the case of uh, research, you're definitely going to want to have uh, research um, ethics board documentation. Uh, not only do you want to know that uh, protocols were approved, but you also want to see things like applications to make sure that um, the commitments made to REBs are in fact the commitments that are being made to you. Uh, you want to do some sort of um, assessment on the impact on privacy. And of course, if you're going to just say something generic like that, it's just well to call it what it is. It's a privacy impact assessment. Uh, so you want to be doing some assessment to consider things like legislative authority, uh, you know, the purpose for which they're looking to, to use the information, uh, any <coughs> safeguards, any subsequent uses and disclosures, that sort of thing, right? So whether or not it's a formal PIA, for those of us who, who work in the privacy world and, and, and work with PIAs, privacy impact assessment, whether it's a formal PIA or it's some sort of application that gets at the heart of assessing privacy, doesn't really matter as long as the assessment occurs. And then uh, the review, well, I mean, the review can, can go very deep sometimes. Uh, what, what we encourage as a working group is to consider many, many questions, uh, as many as you can possibly think of, and, and try to get as much varied expertise as you can uh, involved in the review of these things. Because different perspectives uh, will lead to different questions, and you can, you can consider disclosures in, in different, um, different lights. Okay. So you've gotten, the, you've gotten the request, and you've reviewed it, and you decided that you want to proceed. Uh, not a, not a full-fledged commitment yet, because you haven't sent any data out the door. Uh, but now it's time to assess the risk of re-identification. So as I mentioned before, each disclosure is going to have a, a unique threshold. right? You've got you to consider whatever the posture is of your organization or your jurisdiction. Um, and, and you have to um, take that into account and make a decision for yourself as to what your posture is. Uh, the re-identification risk, when you when you are doing this assessment, and again, the best practice guidelines go very very deep on this topic. Um, 
<clears throat> and I, I would encourage you uh, to take a look at the paper if you've got um, if you want to go deeper on this one. But when you're when you're considering the risk of re-identification, you want to think of it both in terms of um, qualitative measurement and quantitative measurement. So your qualitative, uh, kind of the soft side, that's kind of how I like to think about it. These are things like the previous relationship that you've had with the person making the request, or if there's any agreements in place, uh, what the what the data is. Um, and you know it's hard to know exactly what data is more sensitive than others, uh, but certainly, you know, if there's something happening in your jurisdiction around, um, you know, maybe there's been some media stories of late about wait times uh, for particular procedures or something like that. Well, if you're releasing data associated with wait times or releasing data associated with those procedures. <clears throat> you better think about who it is you're releasing it to and, and what their intent might be. Uh, not to say that the work's not valid, but uh, it might have to be considered in a broader broader context. And as well, you might want to consider what the impact would be if there were an unauthorized use or disclosure. Um, so if there were a breach, um, and, and you're going to have to take that all into account. Um, Another thing that you might want to consider is whether or not you've dealt with that party before and you've found them, um, you know, that they'll say one thing and do another, right? So it's all the softer side. What is what is the impression uh, that you have in terms of risk? And then the quantitative, uh, that's where the work of the, um, the Electronic Health Information Laboratory and, and Khaled's research really comes into play. Um, you know, that quantitative aspect of measuring uh, risk of re-identification. So this is getting into all the, the real uh, mathematical concepts like your uh, k-anonymity for anyone who's familiar with that um, and you know looking at your your outliers and um, you know population counts, geographies, all that sort of stuff. Uh, again I encourage you to take a look at the guidelines if you want to do a deeper dive into this topic. Okay, so then you want to be applying some de-identification because there's, you know, it's a pretty, pretty remote uh, situation, pretty unlikely situation. You're just going to let the data go out the door as it is. The interesting thing about the working group was that uh, many members of the working group were uh, engaged in the disclosure process. So these were people uh, who had sort of that frontline experience with disclosures, and it was nice in the working group uh, to sit with some of these folks and, and hear them say, you know what, we never use that technique just because it seems it's it's really difficult for us to use and it's not well received whenever we, we do consider using it. So um, what the work, what the working group, the discussion in the working group really showed was that you can do a lot with a few basic procedures. You don't have to get into every um, you know, fancy technique. You don't have to be going and reading uh, journal articles uh, to find out the nuances of, of every technique out there. There's some techniques that anyone can use for de-identification and they'll get you a long way. Um, there's a few that I, I've put in the, in the slide here. Uh, many of you will be familiar with it, but uh, just in case you're not, I'll touch on a few. Uh, the first one is one that we call reduction in detail. Um, so that's where you might take something like a postal code, so I've got one up there, <coughs> and you throw away the uh, last uh, three characters of the postal code, so in some sense you've made it a, a broader geographic region, right? If you take a specific postal code, that's going to that's gonna leave uh, the number of people pretty narrow because you're often talking about one side of a uh, short street, you know, in a city. Um, so you've, you've really narrowed your population in that regard. But if you just leave it at the first three characters, uh, you're doing a lot better. I've got a little bit of a typo on the slide there for anyone who's watching. The AOG1AO should have become AOG, not AOA. Uh, suppression. Um, you know, you want to be taking out any records for obvious outliers. Uh, so in this case, uh, you know, if you've got the postal code uh, HOHOHO, uh, we know there's only one family that lives at that address, and uh, that, of course, is Santa Claus and his um, 
uh, next to kin, I suppose. Uh, so you'd want to be excluding them from any uh, data set that you're going to be releasing, right? These are these are your outliers that you're looking for. Uh, for anyone who, who's um, not attending the webinar from Canada, uh, I apologize for that, that inside Canadian joke, uh, but of course, HOH, OHO is the postcode where Santa Claus lives up the North Pole. Uh, substitution is another technique. So you might take a postcode like AOG1AO, uh, which is a postcode in Newfoundland, it starts with A, and you might replace it with another postcode in Newfoundland uh, so that you're still representing the fact that this this uh, record that you're looking at is from Newfoundland, uh, but uh, you don't really need to know all the details about the postcode. Then the next one is the concept of noise, uh, so adding noise into your data. So taking a postal code in this case and moving it a little, right? So we've got a postal code like a AOG1AO, and we're moving it probably a few blocks away with AOG 2S1, right? Um, sometimes noise is a little bit better understood with um, with numbers. So you might take some numeric data and add or subtract a, a bit from it, and that is introducing some noise. Uh, and of course, the other is pseudonymization, which is one that's used you know, in, in pretty much every disclosure out there. Most of the folks who are disclosing information use this one. This is when you take the, those those identifiers, right? Those those core identifiers, uh, direct identifiers, as it were, like Dave Morgan or health number or address, and you replace those with some sort of code, right? Here I've replaced my name with zero uh, nine U three R N, right? And, and that's a meaningless code, but typically somebody will keep that map so that if you had to ever had to revert to the original data, uh, you could. That pseudonymization, creating a pseudonym. Okay, so talking about these de-identification techniques, there were some that we all recognized in the working group as being most common. So everybody's looking to do some sort of pseudonymization. It's very rare that we need to, to give out direct identifiers like name and address. Uh, we're all looking to reduce detail, right? So reduction of detail, if you recall, is with the postal codes, right? So um, <clears throat> you know, uh, making geographic regions broader and that sort of thing. And we're all interested in suppressing data whenever we've got some, some outliers or anything like that. Um, in, in terms of uh, research questions, sometimes people will choose when they present research protocols to exclude uh, vulnerable populations and that sort of stuff. Um, that, that would be a prime candidate for suppression. Um, some of the techniques present analytical challenges. And many people on the working group express the fact that when people are analyzing data, they feel very uncomfortable uh, knowing that noise has been introduced. Uh, they're afraid that the analytical uh, validity of the data has been destroyed. Now, there's all kinds of research out there that suggests what kind of noise you can add in and what are the better ways to introduce noise into your data and that sort of thing. But generally, within the working group, we felt it was a little bit of a tricky area once you start to get into noise. Um, even, even if you don't destroy the analytical validity of the data, people may perceive that you have. Uh, there's software that's commercially available for this. The, the best practice guidelines uh, gets into that. And if any of you are interested in talking a little bit more about that, you can feel free to reach out to Colette or I. I won't get into it in this. Um, in this webinar today. Um, and then, of course, the identification, as I've mentioned, you want to be iterating it with your re-identification risk. And you want to keep iterating until you reach some sort of access acceptable threshold. Of course, you may never reach some sort of acceptable threshold, in which case you might just say, no, we're not going to do this disclosure. And that's that stop condition that I mentioned before. All right, so just a, just a few quick uh, comments to, to wrap up the webinar before we get on to some questions here. Um, so once you've once you've gotten yourself to an acceptable risk, thre risk threshold, you want to be executing some mitigating controls. Um, mitigating controls, uh, they can be agreements or conditions that you express uh, through some sort of letter or something like that with the, with the person who's requested the information. Uh, there's some pretty common ones you want to use. 
you know, you want to place a limit on any sort of subsequent uses and disclosures, right? Typically, you say, I'm releasing it to you for the purpose you, that you've identified, and you can't go and share that with anyone else or use it for anything else. You might have to impose some security controls like encryption. Um, another easy one is uh, getting the requester to commit to not uh, attempt any re-identification. Um, that's, that's a pretty easy commitment to make. Um, you can get into things like uh, destruction and oaths and a right of audit, uh, although I would suggest that that right of audit is implicit regardless. And then finally, once, once the data is out the door, um, you want to get into some monitoring and audit. Okay? So disclosure is irreversible. Any time before disclosure, you've got the freedom uh, to, to, to put the brakes on, to step back in the process or say stop. But once that data is out the door, you might be able to get it back physically, but the disclosure has been made, right? That that um, party to whom you've disclosed has, even for a split second, had access to the information. The disclosure is done. Um, but as I say, the disclosure is not the end of the process, because if you have introduced any sort of uh, agreements, data sharing agreements or conditions, uh, there's some there's some onus on you to be. Uh, monitoring and auditing that. Now, that within the working group, we all appreciated that that effort to monitor and audit is is a bit of a future state. Uh, not many organizations are there yet. Uh, so, a simple starting step for any organization that's looking to disclose uh, is really as simple as picking up the phone and having a conversation with the party uh, to whom you've disclosed. Now, I mentioned the fact that there is some onus to monitor or audit. Uh, in fact, in some jurisdictions, uh, there, is, uh, there is a requirement for a party that's disclosed, say a custodian of false information, who's disclosed for research purposes. If anything goes wrong, say if there's a breach of the information or whatever, uh, the researcher may not be authorized to actually contact the individual. Uh, and in fact, it may come back to the party who is disclosed to reach out to the individuals uh, whose whose information was breached. Uh, so even though you've you've sent the data out the door and you've you've given it your blessing, uh, it may still come back uh, to haunt you or or cause you to do some work. Uh, so there is certainly um, a need to monitor and audit because of that. All right, so. Uh, that's really all that I wanted to say today. So it's about integrating de-identification into a broader process. So talking about de-identification as a standalone is a little bit artificial. You need to consider it in, in a broader context, or you certainly can consider it in a broader context. A few key messages from today. Um, de-identification is all about the minimum necessary. So you should always be thinking about that concept, keeping that in the back of your mind. As I mentioned, de-identification is part of a larger process. You want to be considering de-identification in terms of re-identification risk and what your threshold is, and you want to be iterative about it. Do some assessment of risk, do some de-identification. Your risk is both qualitative and quantitative. Uh, there might be a lot of literature out there and research done on the quantitative, quantitative side of risk, uh, but not so much about the qualitative, but that's equally important. And uh, as I've said, you can always take a step back or say no before you disclose. Uh, but once you disclose, uh, that's it. Uh, the data's out the door. OK, so that's everything that I wanted to say today. Uh, I, I'll turn it over to you for questions. Uh, Colette, I'll, I'll leave it to you if um, uh, you need to remind people as to how uh, they send in their questions. But I'll be keeping an eye on the boxes to see whichever ones come in. Great, thank you very much, David. So now, uh, everybody, you should see a text box um, on your screen. Uh, you can type your questions there, and uh, they will appear on David's screen, and then he can uh, address them as they as they come in. So we'll just give folks uh, 30 seconds, a minute or so, to type their start typing their questions. Uh. And uh, fear not, if uh, if nobody has questions. Um, I have a few um, people planted in the audience uh, ready to uh, throw in a few questions there. 
Uh, no, that's that's not actually true. Uh, but I have a couple things that I can always uh, hit upon a little bit more. Yeah, well, they're coming in. A bunch of folks who are typing in questions, so it'll just take a couple of seconds for uh, <laughs> for them to come through. Yes, I see that coming up there now. I've got a list of names of people who are typing. So. Okay, so um, David, if you can read the questions first before you can before you answer them, that would be great. Absolutely. All right. Uh, so I will um, uh, take one here uh, from Ken, and Ken asks uh, if there's any specific projects uh, where these best practices have been applied and lessons learned. Uh, so Ken, uh, absolutely. There are <coughs> a whole lot of projects that have happened across the country where organizations have um, have applied these best practices because these best practices have come out of um, you know, work that has been done in some of these organizations, like the organization that I work with, the Center for Health Information in Newfoundland and Labrador, um, ISIS, uh, the Institute for Clinical and Evaluation Sciences, and some of the folks who were in Manitoba uh, that participated in the group. We were all using our working examples, right? So we're, we're sending data out the door on a regular basis, and we're using these techniques in varying degrees. Now, of course, getting us all in the room has sort of provided us that global discussion, and we're all we all sort of, you know, raised our eyebrows at certain times and said, um, you know what, uh, maybe we should adjust what we're doing so that we can do it a little bit better. Uh, so, so in some sense, that's the lesson learned. Uh, to get a little bit more specific, um, uh, let me uh, give you an example of a disclosure from from our organization. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have we have disclosed some information for H1N1 uh, in the past uh, for secondary use uh, stuff, uh, particularly around vaccinations and that sort of thing. And lessons learned in that sort of scenario are that uh, there are situations where uh, the urgency and the the trust level between, say, various government organizations allows you to. Um, or forces you to get into a little bit quicker consideration of what your de-identification techniques are and, and what the whole idea, how you want to affect uh, the minimum necessary concept. Um, you know, some in some cases you need to get things out the door. Another specific project um, that we have had of late, um, we've done a number of things uh, with regards to uh, cancer indicators uh, in the past. And uh, in that sort of situation, uh, we have, uh, you know, gone very heavy into uh, things like reduction of detail and, and suppression. So, um, so a couple comments there. Um, I'll take another question here. Uh, I've got one from Lori, uh, who is indicating in slide six, the process slide, uh, do you envision in an EHR environment, so an electronic health record environment, that some elements of the process may be initially performed automatically within EHR systems? Uh, the answer to that is absolutely yes. I'm going to back it up to slide six here. Um, so what you will probably have happen automatically within your EHR systems um, is that there will be some baseline de-identification occur, right? So you have the potential with an EHR system to have uh, better interfaces, uh, better um, knowledge amongst requesters of what the uh, available fields are. There might be a little less back and forth uh, between the requester and the disclosure uh, because it's understood what data elements you have in the EHR. Uh, so what I would suggest is you might see um, entire columns being dropped in terms of de-identification, or you might see uh, easily a reduction in detail, right? So uh, your EHR might have the ability to automatically uh, trim off postal codes or convert things to broader categories like standard geographical codes, right? Uh, within an EHR, 
uh, you're ultimately just talking about software. So you've got the flexibility to, to build interfaces for secondary uses uh, that, that automate as much of this work as possible. So I think it's probably inevitable. Uh, I guess the question is one of time frames. All right. Um, I'll take another one here, um, one from Anita. And Anita asks, uh, would you say that an annual privacy impact assessment be one of the best ways to conduct a regular check on an organization's integration of de-identification practices on uh, a regular basis? <clears throat> hmm. I would say that a, a privacy impact assessment uh, doesn't hurt, but what I might suggest might be a little bit stronger uh, is an audit, right? So if you're if you're ultimately trying to check on uh, how you compare against some sort of standard, really what you're doing is auditing against that. So I suggest that the first step would be to uh, to to formalize some sort of organizational posture around best practices uh, or of de-identification uh, and the integration of de-identification within the disclosure process. And once you've formalize that and get yourself a, uh, a written set of best practices or standards, uh, then you can audit against that. Uh, so the, the PIA can be one tool that you can use, but I, I would think that an audit might be a little bit, uh, little bit stronger tool. Uh, I'll take, uh, I got another question here from Ken uh, in the few minutes that we have left, and I, I have um, I see a few people uh, typing there, so if anyone, if I've got a, a, a new person who's asking a question, I'll certainly try and get you in the list here. Uh, so another question from Ken, are there varying jurisdictional uh, variations that would impact on best practices, uh, re-identification risk, uh, thresholds, uh, criteria, et cetera? Um, absolutely. And, um, <clears throat> What I what I would uh, say is that uh, different different legislation will authorize uh, different you know different disclosures for different purposes, or they're authorized disclosures for different purposes. So in one jurisdiction, you might be able to get away uh, with uh, a research disclosure, uh, providing it's uh, gone through an REB. In other cases, uh, the restrictions around uh, research might be a little bit more uh, consent dependent. Um, so, so that's one way that jurisdictional variations would come in. Another way that jurisdictional variations would come in, and this might even be more so organizational variations, is that uh, things like legislation as such are only one source of uh, constraints on how you disclose information. Uh, typically, databases, uh, when they're created, there's some sort of parameters set around their creation and their subsequent use and disclosure. So there might have been a data sharing agreement or a memorandum of understanding that might have been created uh, for stuff. And you really have to look at, at these data sharing agreements and memorandums of understanding to really understand what you can release from a database. And, and once you know and you get a, a sense of the nuances of what can be released, that's going to have a serious impact on, um, on the types of techniques that you're going to use and the level of risk that you're willing to accept, right? So if, if you've got um, a, a database which has been created for um, <clears throat> a very select set of purposes, very clearly articulated purposes, uh, I would suggest that y you would probably be a little bit more risk averse uh, in that situation uh, in in considering uh, what you're going to do with that, right? If if someone has been very specific about how a database has been used, uh, you're going to have to watch what you're disclosing for. Okay, so uh, I think we're at the 2.30 mark here, Khaled. Uh, I'm happy to take some of the uh, remaining questions that have come up and uh, I can respond to them by email. Uh, that's no problem at all. Uh, 
uh, or if people want to uh, contact me directly, uh, then I'm I'm happy to do that as well. I, I'm not sure what you have done with previous webinars, but uh, I'll well, I think it there's to you. A, there's one one question, um, final question there about the uh, exception of research scenario. So maybe if you can take that one and then uh, sure, and then we'll, we'll yeah. If you if you scan that one, I'll do a quick one here. Yeah. Um, so the question is from Anita, <clears throat> and um, the question is with the exception of the research scenario, Canadian privacy legislation does not require that an agreement be entered into when a custodian discloses de-identified data. While it's certainly a best practice for risk mitigation, did the working group consider a government advocacy program have legislation amended to require an agreement in such cases? Or working with the privacy commissioners to have them issue best practice uh, guidelines on point? Um, not, not explicitly. Uh, did we consider any sort of government advocacy? But we all, as practitioners uh, in this, this disclosure world, all recognized that uh, what legislation says about identifiability and what uh, risk of re-identification exists in practice once you apply various uh, data manipulation techniques are two totally different ball games. And in fact, in some jurisdictions, particularly I'll speak for Newfoundland, we have um, the whole idea of identifiability is based on reasonableness. And of course, once you, you introduce these words like reasonableness into legislation, uh, you introduce a whole lot of subjectivity there. And that is that reasonableness posture can, can vary over time. So really, uh, that is why we're saying within the uh, best practice guidelines that you really almost by default uh, are assuming that your information, whenever you're talking about any sort of record level information, that you're assuming that it has some measure of re-identifiability. So what you're really saying is what is the, what is the risk that is acceptable once you've applied a series of de-identification techniques? So the short answer to your question is no, uh, no consideration of government advocacy program, uh, no explicit consideration of working with the privacy commissioners, but certainly I would suggest that this best practice guideline that's been produced uh, is, a, is a start uh, and a meaningful contribution to this discussion uh, that might encourage uh, governments and commissioners uh, to look at the, the issue a little bit more deeply. Oh,